Hello all, welcome. This talk is sponsored by the Yale Center for Environmental Communication at the Yale School of the Environment. Based at Yale University School of the Environment, the Center for Environmental Communication, or YCEC for short, focuses on four areas. First, we conduct research on the psychological, cultural, and political factors that influence environmental attitudes and behavior. Second, we teach students and train working professionals. Third, we convene a global network of climate communication scholars and practitioners. Finally, we inform and engage the public through environmental journalism, including Yale Climate Connections, a climate-focused news service that engages many thousands of people every day and includes a short daily radio story that airs on more than 700 stations nationwide. As far as the logistics, the chat is closed. We have turned on closed captions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and be aware that you only see the questions you asked. We have folks monitoring the questions, so be assured your question will be seen. We will be making a recording of this conversation available on our website, and we will send a link to everyone who registered. Today's talk will be moderated by Dr. Anthony Lazarowitz. Dr. Lazarowitz is the founder of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication and a senior research scientist at the Yale School of the Environment. He is an expert on public climate change beliefs, attitudes, policy preferences, and behaviors, and the psychological, cultural, and political factors that shape them. He conducts research at the global, national, and local scales, including many surveys of the American public. So oh, thank you, Eric. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, really glad to have you here at this really important moment. Uh, the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, of course, has passed Congress, been signed by the president, and is starting to roll out across the country. This is a conversation and a policy uh, and a piece of legislation and a whole bunch of investments that are going to really roll out over the uh, through the country over the next few years. And uh, we're really here to talk about how do we talk about this? So part of that question is really starting with the question, what do people already know about it or think they know about it? So we're really fortunate today to have a couple uh, fantastic guests with us, and I'll quickly introduce them, uh, and then I'll help set the stage. So first of all, uh, welcome to Lori Lodes. Uh, she's executive director and co-founder of Climate Power an independent strategic communications and paid media operation focused on building the political will and public support for bold climate action. Previously, Lori was Director of Corporate Communications for Apple, uh, overseeing public relations for its corporate values. She also served as Director of Communications at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services for President Obama, and as the Deputy Communications Director for Hillary Clinton during the 2016 election. Welcome, Lori, it's great to see you. Um, our other uh, guest is John Marshall. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Potential Energy Coalition, a nonprofit, nonpartisan coalition that brings together America's leading creative, analytic, and media agencies to shift the conversation on climate change. He's also a professor of marketing at Dartmouth and a senior advisor to Lippincott. Prior to founding Potential Energy, he was the chief strategy and innovation officer at Lippincott, global head of strategy and analytics at the digital agency Digitas, president of the public education company, the Princeton Review, and partner with the consulting firm, Oliver Wyman. Uh, John, welcome aboard. Um, so I'm gonna start first uh, by just kind of uh, uh, providing some of the larger context from our uh, most recent nationally representative surveys. Uh, and of course, this is from our longstanding Climate Change in the American Mind uh, research project. Basically, we've been doing two nationally representative surveys each year, every spring, every fall, every spring, every fall for the past 15 years, along with our colleagues down at the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication. So we did ask a number of questions related to the IRA and uh, infrastructure in our most recent study in December, and I'm just gonna quickly show you some of the major findings. So first of all, just the overall trend in how big of a priority people think climate change should be for the president and Congress. And here we've broken it out by uh, political party and uh, ideology. And you can see in that top line among liberal Democrats and right below that moderate conservative Democrats that basically climate change has soared as a public priority among Democrats 
uh, which I think goes a long way to helping us understand why the IRA got passed in the first place. The underlying politics of this issue really have changed fundamentally within one of our two major political parties. On the other hand, uh, among Republicans, it's been pretty relatively low and flatlined for this entire 15 year period. And this is, of course, something we're all very familiar with, uh, that this issue has become uh, uh, caught up in our gridlock of, of partisan politics. Next slide, please. We've also been tracking to what extent people see cl uh, clean energy as a priority. And again, among Democrats, it's it's gone up a bit, but it's basically always been very, very high. Uh, among Republicans, it's been much higher than support for uh, climate change as a, as a priority. But I do want to point to what's been happening in the last five years is that among both liberal moderate uh, Republicans, that's about a third of the party, and conservative Republicans, about two thirds of the party, uh, priority of clean energy has actually been dropping in the past five years. So it's just to say this, this is part of the background of the landscape uh, that this push to make the transition to clean energy is now occurring within. Next slide, please. So we asked people in this most recent study uh, just a few months ago uh, whether they support building climate-friendly energy production and distribution infrastructure in their own local area. Okay, because this is gonna this is a major build out uh, of of America. It's you know, akin to the interstate uh, system that was built back in the 50s. So do people support solar farms in their local area? Well, 61% of Americans overall, that's the little black diamond you see there, uh, do support it. And that, of course, include, in, includes uh, most Democrats by a long shot, even a good strong majority of liberal Republicans, but only about a third of conservative Republicans say they support that. And then you can see right there that the same is true around electric vehicle charging stations, Democrats very much for it, Republicans less so. Wind farms, again, uh, most groups are for it, including a majority of liberal moderate Republicans, but only about a third of uh, conservatives. Uh, high voltage power lines to distribute clean energy. Uh, now we're getting a little tighter of a spread, but still uh, a majority support at 54%. And then very interestingly, nuclear power plants uh, you know, there's a much more consensus. There's not really a whole lot of enthusiasm for building a local nuclear power plant in your own uh, backyard, so to speak. But interestingly, that's the one policy that conservative Republicans support more than all the other groups. Next slide, please. So coming to the Inflation Reduction Act itself, what we find pretty clearly is that relatively few Americans really have heard much about it. This is the people who've heard a lot or at least some about it. Only 43% of Americans said that they uh, have heard either a lot or some. Uh, and interestingly, the group that's heard the most about it at 55% are conservative Republicans. So we can guess that that's probably because they're hearing about it more often from the news sources that they pay attention to. We've not done a content analysis, but this would lead me to believe that there have been more stories on, let's say, Fox News than there have been on MSNBC or the other uh, networks about the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think we'll see some in more indications of that in a moment. Next slide, please. So given that we knew that many, many Americans just didn't know what this was, we then gave them a, a relatively short description of it, that it aims to curb inflation by reducing the federal deficit, lowering prescription drug prices and the cost of health insurance, modernizing the IRS, and investing in US clean energy production. We told them that it authorizes $391 billion for developing clean energy and addressing global warming, including tax incentives and rebates to help consumers and businesses buy energy efficient appliances, solar panels, electric vehicles, and so on. The IRA also includes support for clean energy jobs and investments in communities that are most harmed by air and water pollution. It's the largest investment the US government has ever made to reduce global warming, and it's projected to help the US reduce its carbon pollution 40% by 2030, and that the law will be paid for by closing ta tax loopholes. And then we ask people, okay, now that you know that, how much do you support or oppose this bill? Okay, next slide, please. So what you're seeing here is how uh, support uh, moves in in part once we inform people. So if you look on the left-hand side, and this is by de various demographics, in blue is the level of uh, awareness of the issue to begin with. So, you know, among uh, Black Americans, uh, only 27% had heard of the IRA uh, before we gave them this definition. But once we told them what it was, you see that 78% of them uh, say, yeah, I, I support that. Uh, 
You can see the same thing among Hispanic and white Americans that basically once they know what it is, most people say, yeah, I, I like this idea. And that's true across the board with all of these. And also there are some interesting patterns. People who have less income tend to have been less aware of, of the IRA. Younger people, Gen Z and millennials were less aware of uh, the IRA. And yet once they learn what it is, 78% of them uh, uh, support it. Uh, and likewise on education. Next slide, please. And then let's just take a look at this breaking down by a uh, political party. So even liberal Democrats, only 49% had heard of the IRA before, but once you tell them what it is, it's almost unanimous. 97% of them say, yes, I support that bill. Moderate conservative Democrats move, uh, well, 34% had heard of it, but 91% support it once they learn about it. Um, Liberal moderate Republicans, 30% had heard of it before, and you've got two thirds of them support this bill once they get that definition. But then comes conservative Republicans, and it's just, you gotta see, look at the colors. 55% had heard of it uh, before we told them what it was. And then even after we tell them what it was, only 23% of them support the bill. Um, so, and we did not, if you remember in the description, we didn't say anything about partisan, politics or anything like that, the only cue, political cue they get is in this phrase right here that was passed by the U.S. Congress and signed by President Biden. So all of which suggests to me that the narrative that they're hearing in the news and the media that they're paying attention to is basically uh, telling them that this is not a good idea. Next slide, please. Um, so one, that all that prior work I think is really important because it suggests there's an enormous communication opportunity that when people learn about this bill, they like it, okay? But most of them have never heard about it. So there's a communication gap. Houston, we have a communication problem and our guests are gonna talk a bit more about what they're gonna do, what they're doing to try to fill that gap. But even so on a kind of a deeper level, even after people have been told what is in the bill, um, they're not convinced yet that it's actually going to accomplish its various intended goals. So only 34% of Americans think that this bill is going to help reduce global warming, okay? 61% of liberal Democrats do, but it's only 61% of liberal Democrats. Um, will it reduce the cost of health care? Only 27% of Americans think, yes, it will. Will it reduce inflation? Only 24% think it will. Will it reduce electricity power shortages? 21% say so. Will it reduce gas prices? Only 20% think so. And will it reduce the cost of energy, uh, of, sorry, of electricity? Only 18% think so. Even liberal Democrats uh, don't really think it's going to affect the cost of electricity. And yet those of us who know this bill and what it's intended to do, we know that's actually one of the things it's really going to do. Uh, it's going to hype supercharge uh, the transition to cheaper uh, and cleaner uh, renewable and clean energy. Next slide, please. Um, and moreover, they're not convinced yet that's really going to help them or the country. So you do get more support and a very strong partisan divide here. Uh, will the Inflation Reduction Act help future generations of people? Democrats say, okay, yeah, sure, it'll help future generations. Uh, Republicans not so convinced. Will it help low-income communities and communities of color who are disproportionately harmed by pollution? Democrats say, yeah, probably. Uh, uh, Republicans not so much. Will it improve the health of Americans? Mm, maybe. Uh, to some degree, again, very strong partisan split, the economy and jobs, again, strong partisan split. But then when it comes to you and your family, or you personally, or national security, suddenly we see that not even a majority of Democrats are convinced that they personally or that their family uh, will benefit from this. And of course, so much of the IRA is about incentives to help families and households uh, take advantage of these new technologies and these new energy sources. So um, next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to hand the baton over to Lori, who's gonna to talk to us about what Climate Power is learning and doing. Thanks so much, Tony. Hi everyone, Lori Lotus, Climate Power. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to talk through this. And what I wanna walk through is a bunch of research we have done at Climate Power that really Tony just ran through uh, based on what Yell has done. And then you'll of course hear from John, and I think the big takeaway is like all of this really shows a path forward on how we should be communicating and what we need to do to make sure 
that all of the uh, progress we have made is durable um, because it's 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 not right. We have to secure the progress um, that we've already made. Um, so, Eric, thank you. Next slide. So I'm going to run through uh, a few of the findings. We did this research. Um, we've done a bunch of focus groups and other qualitative data, um, as well as polling. We are about to go into a bunch of states to do a lot of this as well, just to figure out where are people right now um, and how do we need to help move them um, to this sort of clean energy understanding that um, I am sure all of us have. So next slide, please. So one of the things that I think that Tony touched on and that is really clear is just that people do not know about the clean energy plan that's been passed, right? Um, and so even, uh, so this first slide really looks at voters know, if the voters know it, they view it mainly uh, favorable, but I wanna look at the, they no opinion either way. And that is what is really clear is that people don't know anything about it. Um, and these approval, uh, the approval that you see here, the 50%, yes, it's being driven by Democrats, but even that is probably, you know, we're giving them a little bit of a prompt of like, Congress has recently passed a new clean energy plan. Do you approve or disapprove? So that's probably inflated as far as how much do people really know about it? So number one, people don't know anything. Next slide. But number two is that when they hear the specifics about what it does, they like it, overwhelmingly so. So I just wanna go through um, a few of these pieces that, and show the strength of support. So upgrading the US electric grid, that is a key part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and a key part of the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed earlier is making it so that it can actually handle the increase in uh, clean energy sources. 76% support. When you see numbers that high, not only is it the liberal Democrats and more conservative Democrats and the independents, it's Republicans as well. 72 support, 72% support creating new jobs and job training in clean energy. 67% support providing incentives to businesses and consumers to, to really ramp up the production of clean energy and to reduce the cost of clean energy. And then 65 support, 65% 65 support um, expanding and speeding up that transition. So number one, people don't know anything. Number two, but when they find out the facts about what the Inflation Reduction Act does and what has been passed already, um, they like it. Next slide, please. And when voters find out, when people find out the magnitude of what is already happening, they're blown away by it. And this is, I think, a really important, um, it, it's a really important distillation of like what we are trying to communicate. So I just wanna, I wanna read this entire question. In just the last four months, um, now it's been six months, since the passage of this clean energy plan, companies from across the country have already announced, at this point, 90 new clean energy projects that will deliver over 90 billion into local economies and create nearly 100,000 jobs. There's, for 45% of people, that makes them hopeful, which is a unique, a unique feeling for people to have right now, right? There's a lot happening and there's a lot of, um, conflict and consternation uh, with folks, 13% satisfied, 11% surprised. Yes, there might be a part of that's like, surprise, don't believe it. But I do think a big part of that is like surprised that there's been that much that's happened so quickly. The thing that I think is really the driving, uh, sort of our driving takeaway from the research that we have done is to make sure that people understand that this is all happening right now. One of the, one of the issues um, that I think people have is thinking that it's really off in the future, right? We're building this clean energy economy. It's gonna happen someday, but it's like, it's there, right? It's years, decades from now. 
And it is happening every single day right now. And it's one of the big things that we wanna be communicating about. Next slide, please. Seeing is believing, and this is it, right? People believe when they see it. And so what we need to do on the outside, on, you know, what we need to do is to make sure that people are in fact seeing how it's benefiting their communities, how it's benefiting their friends, their neighbors, and people like them. And so it's one of the things that we've been really focused on is lifting up all of these announcements that have been made by companies, because what this does, it helps localize it, right? There's, and I think John will uh, probably touch on this. When people are here, you know, it's going to create 9 million jobs. That just is not something that people can relate to or connect to. But you'll see one of the, uh, one of the headlines here is Q-Cells bringing 2,000 jobs uh, solar manufacturing campus to Bartow County, um, part of a 2.5 billion expansion in Northwest Georgia. This is um, Dalton, Dalton, Georgia, and Q Sales just made an announcement this week. 2,000 jobs, and just to be, just to make it even clearer, this is a, you know, a community that's about an hour and a half northwest of Atlanta. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Green is the congresswoman for this district, and when she heard about this announcement. She actually said, I'm excited because these are real investments in communities, right? Not only is it investments in the local communities, it's investments in the local, in the local uh, constituents and people. 2,000 jobs in a place like Bartow County is, um, is huge, right? So we want to be showing these wins, all of this progress that's happening all across the country every single day. Next slide. So we have four basic communications uh, imperatives, which I, I hope the slides that we just ran through sort of show you how we got to these. Number one is to show the progress, illustrate the progress that is being made right now. It's not just about job creation. It's about these new projects coming up in the communities and what that's going to mean for these local communities. We're working with a company um, outside of Pittsburgh um, and there was a large manufacturer that left a, you know, a, about 15 years ago, I think, um, maybe more than that, maybe two decades. And it shut down the town when the company left, right? The high school closed. They started having to bust their kids to a nearby um, or to another uh, uh, community's school. Um, folks didn't have jobs, people moved away. And a clean energy manufacturer has since moved in in just the past year, and they cannot keep up with how much hiring they need to do. They're trying to hire 25 to 30 people every single week and putting everybody's skills to use. And so I think the reason why I say that is like, this is about rebuilding communities as well as giving good paying job opportunities um, to people all across the country. Number two is to show these outcomes on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, I, I will, I'll sort of say it again, but we really have to show people and not just tell. One of the things that I didn't run through is um, our research around cost. People are really worried about the cost of energy, right? They get a daily reminder of how much it is when they go by the gas stations. And so one of the things that we really need to do is to show people how it's going to help lower their cost, right? I am sure there is many, are many folks on the call right now who have solar panels and could talk about what it's meant for their uh, utility bills, but we want a steady drumbeat of these personal testimonies and stories about how climate action and the clean energy benefits are really benefiting people's lives. Number three is to how people can take advantage of the benefits really in what they already believe in, right? When people hear about clean energy, they already believe that it will lower pollution. They believe that it will mean that their health could improve, right? Less smog, less pollution, that's a good thing. And, you know, in some ways, because of um, the travesty 
of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, people do have a sense that we need to become less dependent on fossil fuels and we do need real energy of independence and that's through, uh, through um, clean energy. So people know that, so we just have to show them and how it's going to, um, how it's gonna uh, benefit their lives. And number four, number four is say and show how. We have to show people that this is not just for elite and for people who can really afford it. It's not for the wealthy, it's for everyday people. And that's the power and the opportunity with the Inflation Reduction Act specifically, is it is going to lower the cost of a lot of things and make it more attainable and more abundant. Um, one of my like sort of favorite facts right now is electric vehicles, of course, um, you know, there's a challenge of people think they're like they're for other people. I have an electric vehicle and I can say how amazing it is to drive. But what people also need to know is how much those costs are coming down. There already is two different models, um, U.S. made cars that cost less than $20,000 after the tax credits, right? That is less than the average cost of a combustion engine car. So we need to really keep making the case and showing people how it is getting more affordable um, because, and John will go into this, like people aren't there. And so we have to show them how it, um, how it will be. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna run through this very quickly. So Climate Power, we are a strategic communications organization. I really see climate as our candidate. And the big thing that we are gonna be focused on is defining these benefits for people and communities because I said that we need to make this law durable. We have to make it durable. I worked on passing the Affordable Care Act and then making sure it wasn't repealed and was implemented um, as well as it could be. And we have to make sure that people understand and understand the benefits so that it can keep clean energy and climate action popular. You saw those numbers from Tony, right? Um, the percent of people who like who really believe in climate action, who believe in clean energy, that is not defined for the long term. We have to keep it there, which means we have to work at it to make sure that it remains popular. Next slide, please. So the three things that we are really doing to do that is to one, drive a national narrative about the climate law. We are, and number two, and I'm gonna tie these back together, is to sell the benefits of climate action into key communities. Um, but these are really one and the same. As I, as I keep talking about, these are investments that are being made in every zip code across the country. And that is cyclical, right? We have to tell the story of what is happening in local communities and make sure that becomes a part of the national conversation as well. Conventional wisdom is a big thing and we need to make clean energy and this really incredible opportunity we have for a clean energy future to become that conventional wisdom that there is no choice but for cleaner, more affordable, more abundant um, clean energy. And number three, every single day, their um, lobbyists from oil and gas uh, and fossil fuel allies, several of those, um, many of those happen to be members of Congress, are weaponizing what has already been accomplished. They are trying to claw it back and they're trying to dismantle the progress that we've all made together. There is oversight hearings in Congress to try to undermine what this progress actually means. And I know this is something that Tony, can, Tony and I can both talk about for a very long time is just the prevalence of disinformation and the impact that has on people and what we need to do to counter that is to really make sure that people have the facts and that they understand that electric vehicles are now less than $20,000, right? Um, and just how prevalent uh, clean energy 
wind and solar and battery manufacturers um, are and how it's growing every single day. Next slide. So what we're doing, we sort of bring it all together. So we are doing a lot of testing and research, a lot of earned media, making sure elected officials, allies, grassroots partners know about the facts and the research that is out there. Um, we, of course, put a lot of this on television or on um, digital media um, and sort of pulling it all together um, so that we can drive a holistic communications effort across the movement, really focused on how do we keep building on the progress that we have made and take it even further. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to Tony and my friend, John Marshall. Fantastic. Thank you, Laurie. That was great. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor over very quickly to John. Welcome. Hey, everybody. That was awesome, Laurie. Thanks. I'm going to touch on some similar themes. I, I learned a lot from both of you. Really great stuff. Um, so yeah, so Potential Energy are a, um, we're a collection of former professional marketers. So we used to work with the Walmarts and the Starbucks and the Bank of Americas. And we're trying to figure out how to sell this product uh, that we call Climate and Clean Energy. And so we've basically been deploying the toolkit that we've used in the in professional for-profit context into the climate and clean energy space. And so I'm going to go through some of the results of our, of our research and give a few guideposts of what we've learned. So we can go, go to the next slide. Um, so this is, our, this is our goal. We're trying to figure out how to get people to care about climate change and clean energy. And I can assert with confidence that nobody wakes up in the morning and says, what a great day for a heat pump. Uh, nor do they wake up in the morning and say, I wonder if there are tax incentives lying around that I can use. And so there are real people on the other end of all of our communications and they're living their lives and they're, they're going through a lot of challenges that aren't necessarily the things that we care about. And so what I'm trying to figure out is what every marketer tries to sort through is relevance. How do we make uh, Clean Energy and Inflation Reduction Act relevant to your average American? So I'll tell you what we've done and I'll tell you what we've learned for the next page. So I won't present every word on this page, but we've done a lot of research. We've, we've done statistical randomized control trial message testing about four of those studies with a total size of about 24,500. We have a digital lab where we've run a whole bunch of ads and measured responsiveness to a broad range of ways to engage people. And we've done a whole bunch of focus groups and dial tests in, in lots of different areas. And what did we learn? Um, I'm gonna go to the next page. I guess just before I do that, I, I think our theory as as you know marketing professionals are, is we might have a thing that to say that people aren't that interested in, and so let's just accept that we got to meet people where they are, and we're gonna if we want to move them, we're gonna have to connect what they care about, their lives, their values, their feelings, their families, their communities, their their cities, their values, and their identities, and we're gonna have to find ways in. And so let me let me tell you. Three of the challenges we face, and I'll give you a few solutions that we've discovered. So go to the next page. Oh, I got a summary page before that. So we've done, we've also done some, some background research. I, I think that most people, when they say I know about the Inflation Reduction Act, lie. <laughs> so when you quiz them as to what's in the Inflation Reduction Act, our feeling is it's more, the one, more about like one in 10 who actually know what it's about. Uh, there may be some that may have gone up since this survey happened, but there are not many people who know that much about it. Interestingly, in our research and the good news is an increasing number of people in our qualitative research, almost everyone agreed that climate change was real and progress was good and clean beats dirty and there was actually a lot to work with. Um, and most people do see clean being the future. But when you ask them when they say 30 years, they say 40 years, they say 25 years, they don't say what Laurie was pointing out is so important that this is a now thing. Uh, and so we have a, a knowledge issue uh, and we have a relevance issue. Um, not a single person in our focus groups, whether on the left or right, urban or rural, believe that we can accomplish 100% clean energy future without difficulty. So they're seeing obstacles. They're seeing this as being challenging. They're seeing this as being expensive, and they're seeing this as, as involving sacrifice. Go to the next page. Okay, I'm going to give you three challenges, and then I'm going to give you four answers. So I'm going to start with a negative, again, with a positive. So um, we have a database. We've tested about 400 messages and randomized control trials, and we look for, is it increasing support? Uh, on the vertical axis. And we also look for trust. Uh, the yellow are the Inflation Reduction Act messages we tested last summer right after the passage of the bill. And the blue are the Inflation Reduction Act messages that we tested in January. Um, and uh, the 
there's a, there's a path through this, by the way, uh, but what you can see is they're fairly low compared to all these other climate and clean energy messages we have tested. Why is that? Is because they begin with the two words that will depress the performance of any message. I can guarantee you it'll cut it by half, which is the and government. Okay, so all of these messages that we tested started with the two words, the and government. And so a very important thing for us to realize is in order for people to get excited about this, they are going to have to hear from, from people who are non-political messengers. We're going to have to broaden this into culture. That's not to say that government officials don't need, deserve, uh, and should get the win for this, but we need to recognize that your average American, when I start a focus group and I say the government is on X from you, they now get on their device and start thinking about other things. Okay, so that's challenge number one. Trust and relevance are critical and they are hard to generate. The second challenge, if we go to the next page, um, is that no one thinks the Inflation Reduction Act reduces inflation. Um, and so we can, side note, I don't think we should call it the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and I think Laurie and Tony would agree. Let's, uh, there's lots of different ways we could talk about it. The climate plan, the clean energy plan seems to be a really good place that the climate power folks um, are landing. But in, in all of our qualitative and quantitative research, what you hear is, I don't see that making anything cheaper. Um, I can't afford an electric car. That's for wealthy people. That's not for me. The cost of switchover, that seems expensive. I've only got $400 in my pocket. How do, I, how do I afford some of these things? I think the cost of getting to people to this point is what I don't love about it. And so there is not a mindset in the American public that there is a tool out there, especially coming from these two words, the and government, that will necessarily reduce their costs. Is that true? No. Is it the belief that we're working against? Yes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do about that. But we're, we we need to find ways to talk about cost reduction that, in ways that people accept rather than they don't. When the, the barriers are reasonably high. The third thing that I want to point out on the next page is what we often say isn't always what they hear. Okay. And I think Laurie touched on this. We cannot say that this at a high level, the IRA is going to create a million well-paying middle-class jobs because your average person is like, really, are these jobs for me? Um, I've heard that before. I've never necessarily seen them. What we can do is we can say in your community, uh, there, are X, there are X benefits and X factories coming up and why specific things that are happening. When people say the law will lower costs for everyday Americans and reduce inflation, the average person says, none of this is going to help me pay my rent or my bills today. Um, when we say that the government is giving out massive rebates and discounts on things like clean home appliances, people say, you've got my attention, but how come I haven't heard about this before? There must be a catch. And by the way, many people said, I don't think this Inflation Reduction Act is real, because if it was, I would have seen and heard about it. And so there's a, there's a communications hurdle. Um, and the last thing I want to point out is when we say that we need people to transition away from the many products we are currently using, we have to recognize that many people like their lives like it is, okay? And so we've got to figure out a way to be relevant and sell, sell the benefits. So I'm done with the challenges. I'm going to go into the opportunities. We'll go to the next page. What do we do? And the page after. Number one, there's a big frame shifting we need to do. And we need to recognize we've got to move from sacrifice to benefits, from expensive to attainable, from elitist, which clean energy is still considered, to the norm. We've got to pattern regular folks, people like me, actually using clean energy, from later to today, to echo Laurie's point. And we need to move from politicians to new messengers. We need to embed this into culture. Answer number two, go to the next page, is there are four traps uh, that we, we try and make sure we avoid. Just blatantly saying it's cheaper is not necessarily going to get people. There's a second trap, which is we need to sacrifice. Talking about doing less or giving up on things doesn't get people's attention. The government is outlawing or bans or those kinds of things are tricky. And cars are interesting and cars are important, but cars are seen as, as expensive right now. And range anxiety is real. I think this changes a lot next year, the year after, the year after, and the year, year, year after. Um, but it can't all be about the car. Uh, it's got to be about a whole series of things that are happening in your schools and electric buses and in your communities and on the farm and all these different places. And even though there's a lot of marketing energy going into the car, the car's not yet mainstream. It will get there and it should be more about the car. So those are four traps to avoid. Um, and then we go to the next page. Here's, here's something I'm really excited about. Uh, we've done four of these tests right now where we tested different messages and we saw how much lift we got in support for the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and the message of landmark achievement toward climate progress has come out on top each time. I'll show you what that narrative is. Energy independence as well, safety and health does well. Jobs can be framed in lots of different ways. If you frame it like Laurie's talking about, um, does well. If you're in an aggregate, does less well. But the message that we have made a landmark achievement on climate should not be buried in the, in the, uh, in the 
uh, and the search to tell people about their heat pumps in their cars and their solar panels and so forth. We have made a big on that. So I'm going to show you this message. I'm going to tell you why I think it does well. So we go to the next page. I've got some, some highlighters on here. So this has been our leading performing message so far. Um, and the, I'll just read you the yellow. Landmark investment to tackle climate change. The use of dirty energy has been emitting heat traffic pollution. It always makes sense to talk about dirty energy. And it all makes sense to explain what climate change is. Because not that many people realize that heat trapping pollution is actually, you know, causing our planet to overheat, and asserting the fact that experts expect a forty percent reduction in toxic air and carbon pollution. Uh, watch that I say those words: toxic air and carbon pollution. Um, we're not talking about the CO two emissions and GHGs and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about toxic air and carbon pollution, regular stuff, um, and that this plan actually can turn the tide in tackling climate change. That actually is working for a lot of Americans. And it's not quite as polarizing as you think. Moderate conservatives are actually lifting reasonably well on a landmark achievement on climate. I think we need to sell that. And it's a lot. there's a lot to be proud of there. So that's my thought on messages that work. We go to the next page. Um, I want to make a point about cost super quick. Uh, it's not that easy to say, hey, you're going to save money. People are like, I don't think I'm going to save money. But if you say that everyone is struggling with high prices and high energy bills, and these fossil fuels are limited in supply, and that we're never going to ride on a solar or solar and wind. It's unlimited, and the price never goes up. <laughs> and so that actually has turned out to be a, a, also a very highly effective message. So you want to talk about cost, talk about abundance, uh, talk about the limitlessness and the cheapness of our natural resources. Uh, we'll never run out of America is a phrase that we sometimes use. There's a sort of a concept that there's a there's a cheap and affordable and American uh, way of living. So those are a couple of thoughts on narratives. I'm going to give you two more thoughts and then and then close out for questions. The fourth answer, which echoes a lot of what the Climate Power team has found, is local, local, local. Anytime we talk about pride, the pride of Wisconsin and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Iowa, and we're winning and we're doing things, and people like me, uh, you know, are making progress on this, works extremely well. And particularly when we talk about the concept of a cleaner Wisconsin, a cleaner Pennsylvania, a cleaner Iowa. So the concept of clean fighting pollution and doing that locally has been a very resonant message. So go to the next page and I'll um, gonna, just to make one last guide and then I'm gonna lead with a messaging platform. There's a bunch of vernacular that works better than other vernacular. Pollution works better than emissions. Use overheating, not warming. Uh, talk about extreme weather, it's more it's more universal. Cleaner, self, self, safer, healthier always works. Sustainable is narrow. Talk about abundance. Um, we need to move away from some products and move toward others. Let's call it an upgrade, not a ban. Um, and instead of this feeling like a mandate, uh, having us feel like an opportunity and a direction from we must to here's how. I'm going to land with one page and then we can go to questions, which is our best, um, our best um, effort at a messaging platform. And so what we like to say is we're in a transition from dirty and expensive to clean and abundant because clean energy is better for me and for my community. There's been a landmark climate and clean energy law that gives financial benefits to families and communities to accelerate our shift, cleaner, safer, and healthier, and that there's three pillars underneath that. We're making major progress stopping the pollution that's overheating the planet. Uh, mark the fact that I didn't say, you know, stop climate change. I said stopping the pollution that's overheating the planet. We're talking like regular talk about actually what's happening in people's lives. We're ending dependence on dirty, expensive energy, and that's providing direct benefits for me in my community. So that's what we've got at potential energy and I think I'm done. And Tony, we've got some time for questions. Fantastic. Thank you, John. That was great. Uh, lots and lots of great material there. Uh, hopefully very useful material for many of the people on the call. Um, let's see. One question that we've seen uh, goes back to what uh, in particular all three of us have touched on. And that's one of the challenges that we're facing here is not just that people are unaware of the IRA or don't know very much about it, even if they think they've heard of it, is that there's still this underlying question of or lack of confidence in the government's ability to actually help America progress. And so, um, you know, I, I'd be curious to see what both Lori and John have to think about this. It seems to me that we have to recognize there are at least two different narrative levels. One is the narrative that we're mostly talking about here, which is what do people understand about the IRA itself as a policy, as a set of uh, incentives and so on. And there's a lot to be said there to, as Lori said, help them understand what this, this bill is. 
But that's on top of a much deeper narrative that has been under, uh, it's basically a narrative that's been pushed for the past 50 years, which is that the government is your enemy, not your, not your government. Like, remember the old phrase of, by, and for the people? Um, instead, government has been turned into uh, a, a phrase, the government, which is often seen as, well, as Ronald Reagan famously said, you know, uh, I, the what is it said? The worst uh, sentence and the scariest sentence in American uh, language is uh, "Hi, I'm from the government. I'm here to help." Okay, so where you've turned the government itself into the, the enemy, or certainly not something that is ever capable of actually improving people's lives, that then becomes rich narrative territory for opponents to try to uh, say this is all a boondoggle or this won't work or whatever. So anyway, I'm with that just frame in mind, I'm wondering if Lori or John, you have any thoughts about the nature of that problem or how we can help address it? Yeah, I'll jump in and then I am sure John has thoughts on it as well. Um, it's one of the things that really has come out in all of our research, but really all of the research that is out there and just, you know, uh, living in our society today, it's obvious, right? That lack of trust in government is a real problem. Um, and it also, it leads people to question if there is a plan or could there even be a plan for the government to help transition to clean energy, right? Because it's just, it does not, it is not necessarily credible to people that there would be a well-considered thought out plan if it's coming from the government. Um, and people, you know, will it be done in a way that minimizes disruption, that don't doesn't leave people behind or avoids unforeseen consequences? And I think one of the things also is like, we're in a, what can we get done this month, this year? You know, like we need to go fast, fast, fast just because of how big the problem is. But for folk, for like, you know, everyday people out there who, as John said, aren't waking up every day thinking like we are, what can we do about clean energy today? Um, they think 2035 seems like we're probably rushing things, right? Like there are just a sort of lack of um, belief that this can happen as quickly as we think it should. And that is why it goes to like one of the main uh, points of, I made is like seeing is believing and people need to see things happening in their community and that there is a plan and that President Biden and the government has a plan and that it's actually happening right now. And that will help alleviate, and maybe alleviate's not the right word because I think we have a much bigger sort of democ democratic, you know, democracy problem in our country, but it will help people to believe, oh, okay, this is okay and it's real, um, but they need to see the government walking the walk. Um, and that is the only thing that's really going to help counter the lack of trust uh, that folks have, that the government can do anything. Thank you, Lori. Uh, John, do you have any thoughts about that question? No, hard to improve on that. I think I'm in the Lori Lodes show, show not tell movement. And if someone's going to tell, maybe it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson saying that the government did something good for you rather than the government saying it. That would increase the odds, but I love, I love the answer. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, look, trust is easy to lose, but takes a long time to earn. And uh, I think that is it. It's proof is pudding. People need to see it. And really specifically to this conversation, they need to hear about it. It's not just do you see it when you drive down the street and you maybe see a billboard that says, you know, this solar farm brought to you by the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, I would love it if there were uh, if there were signs like that. But in particular, it's the stories that we tell. It's the stories of the people, individual people's lives who've been made better because of these investments. Uh, you know, people who can suddenly afford electricity in a way that right now it eats most, uh, you know, a huge chunk of their of their uh, annual budget. And suddenly they're now able to have some disposable income because they're now getting uh, energy so much uh, cheaper. Um, that's just one of literally thousands and thousands of stories of people's lives who are already beginning to be improved by this. And as this rolls out, uh, of course, that's going to happen more and more and more. Um, let's see. Another basic question, and we are getting close to time here. 
Um, but there's an interesting question here that much of our conversation so far has been about the general American public. And clearly the public is going to play a critical role in implementing the IRA because a lot of the IRA is incentives for everyday people to buy electric cars or to install heat pumps and to do all those other things. But there's also, of course, a decision maker component to the rollout of the IRA. I mean, government officials and businesses have to uh, take steps themselves to implement the IRA. So here's a question of, is there any difference in the way that we should be thinking about communicating to leaders as opposed to the general public? I don't you know start on that, John. I don't know. That's it's in your zone of expertise. I mean, I think, um, I think people leaders need to know that this is popular. Like the 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 thing that's always crazy about climate change and clean energy is the number of people who care about it is a lot higher than than the number of people who than you think that other people care about it. And I, so I think the way to communicate. Like this is popular stuff. The fighting climate change is popular stuff. Um, you know, cleaning up local communities is popular stuff. Laurie's data says it's popular stuff. And so I think, you know, foundation number one is to is to make sure people people know and that leaders know that this is a winner, uh, and there's only one there's only one side to be on, and it's it's just that it is a win win. So in my experience, that's that's how to sell it, and then and then help decision makers talk like humans and like in the ways that can connect because we're we're lost in a sea of decarbonization and net zero. And so just getting this, humanizing this whole thing and making it about an anti-pollution, like we're not, we're not fighting climate change, we're fighting the polluters who are causing climate change. There's just a whole bunch of narratives that that connect a lot better that decision makers would benefit from. And I, I agree with John, like, honestly, I'm not sure, I'm not sure there really is a different message because we also want our elected leaders to be talking to their constituents about this. I completely agree with John. Like we need new messengers out there. And at the end of the day, our politicians aren't going to be what like really drives this forward, but we need, but they also do have a bully pulpit and we need them out there and we need them saying the thing, saying not only the right things, but the things that are going to resonate with, uh, with their constituents. So I honestly don't think it's really any different. Um, I also know for a fact how eager many uh, of the folks, uh, of the members of Congress are to go back to their communities and to really talk about what, you know, to, to sell this and to talk about all of the benefits that are going to be from it. And I think you're going to see more and more of that happening. At the same time, we are, and I'm, a, I, despite not living in D.C., I'm a creature of Washington, D.C., and we're about to be upon April recess, um, which is the time that co members of Congress go back to their hometowns. A lot of times they hold town halls or do some sort of public event. Um, and I would say all members of Congress, you know, I know I've been looking through the questions and people are sort of like, what can we do? Is like all members of Congress no matter what side, need to be hearing from their constituents about how much, how excited they are about this and how much more needs to happen because that's how we're going to stay, how they're going to stay emboldened um, and how folks who are climate skeptics are going to understand that their views are not held by the majority of people in this country. Yeah, those are great suggestions. And I would just add to that, that we already know from research that most members of Congress actually doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, dramatically underestimate the level of support from their own constituents. So I really want to underscore what Lori has said of that is a critical role of any concerned citizen is to let your elected officials know that that they are not alone, okay? That in fact, the water is safe to swim in. Uh, there's actually a majority of their own constituents who support uh, taking action on climate change and clean energy. Um, and then the other is for those um, members who do go out and want to talk about it, I would say one of the most important things that they can do is actually shine the spotlight on and elevate the voices of the people in the community who are actually benefiting from these programs. So I know every politician wants to have the stage off into themselves and, and the limelight, but really what I would ask them to do is to 
use that limelight and direct it on some of the fantastic stories of people whose lives are being improved right there in their own community. That's going to be, in the end, way more powerful uh, than anything they probably say. Um, so last major question here is uh, people are asking, how can we execute on your findings? Okay, so like I'm not running an advertising agency, I'm not running a big shop, but what can I do to help execute on some of these findings? Uh, John, do you have any suggestions? Um, I think, I think like we, I don't know, we all have, if, we all don't have the same size media budgets as potential energy and climate, power, but we all have our constituents. And um, I think starting to use frames that are human, uh, that are local, and getting engaged locally, and uh, advocating for the progress that's getting made locally would be uh, would probably be what I would what I would say. Mm -hmm. Lori, do you have anything to add? So sort of what I said just a moment ago, I think applies of like talking to your member of Congress goes so far. I mean, it just, it, I really mean that. It goes a very long way. Having, having, you know, going to a town hall, there's really nothing more important that folks could do. Um, because I do think it is that creating that surround sound for people one of the things that we, um, and I don't know if Tony and John have seen this, but in our focus groups, one of the big changes that we've seen is how in most of our focus groups now, somebody will be like, I have solar panels or my brother put in solar panels or you know, my neighbor or friend or whatever. And so it is becoming like, there's this shift that's taking place, but those sorts of testimonials just in everyday life are really important. It creates what we like to refer to as social proof. And so when you are out there using your social networks, talking to your friends and family about any of this, it goes so far. Um, again, I mean that in the positive way. It like really does go so far um, because people can see themselves in you and they can see, you know, they can make that connection so I would just say, you know, everybody has a voice, everybody has a platform. It is the amazing thing about the really weird digital age that we are in right now, um, sort of putting Twitter aside. Uh, and so I would just encourage everyone to keep on speaking out. And also like this is, you know, such a, uh, a thing from long ago. People still read newspapers, letters to the editor is still important. I saw one of the questions come in about local media. Local media is really important. And so we're really working hard to get more local media coverage of these types of things. But obviously you on the ground, um, there's always something that you can do to help tell that story. Now, that's great. And I would just say there's an interesting parallel with climate change around clean energy. And that is uh, we need to help people understand that it's here and now, not distant in time and space, and that there's too much silence. You need to break that silence and talk about it. And I would just say, this is where I feel like we often get stuck of like, okay, what can I do? So I'm gonna reduce my carbon footprint by changing out my furnace for a heat pump. And you know that's a good thing. Of course you wanna do that. But perhaps your bigger superpower is actually demonstrating to other people that people like them do this, okay? We know that, that when one person puts solar panels on their roof, it increases the odds that somebody else in their neighborhood put solar panels on their roof. And when two households put solar panels on their roof, it increases the odds yet again that somebody else in that neighborhood put solar panels on their roof because it's social proof. It's not even talking, it's demonstrating. And so I think that is exactly the, the kind of thing that we all have within our power. So with that, I want a big thank you to both uh, Lori and John. Uh, this is a really wonderful hour. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I think that I've seen a number of calls for sharing of slides, and I think we can probably do that. Um, so Eric, I'm going to turn it back over to you to close us out. Thank you, Tony, for moderating the conversation and Lori and John for your presentations and insights. 
we will send everyone a follow-up email after this event with the recording and information on the next event of our spring speaker series, which will be in late April, where we hope uh, you'll join us for a panel on how social media influencers are shaping the public conversation on climate. Have a great weekend, everyone, and thank you for joining us.